Hey, players, welcome back. This is episode 10 of The Real DEA Narcos talking about The Real DEA Narcos. Now, like I told you after teasing episode 9, this is when stuff gets real. This is when Javier does some stuff probably never done before in diplomatic history. He actually confronts the Escobar family without Pablo at the airport as they try and leave the country. Also, they still got the frequency for Pablo's son and for the radio phone they're using, so that thing heats up. And also, the U.S. ambassador calls Joe Toft, Javier and Steve's boss, into the office and say he's got an informant in Miami, and they send Javier on a wild goose chase to Miami right as they're closing in on Pablo. So in this episode, we get to that. We get to finding Pablo. We see what actually happened when the Colombian National Police, working with the DEA, find, kill, and put an end to the reign of Pablo Escobar. So guess what, folks? Spoiler Pablo dies. Pablo's been dead for a long time now, but this is the real story behind that. So everybody stay tuned. We're going to get into that. But if you're listening to this, it means you're a player in the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, the game of crimes. We want to thank you. Murph and I just want to give you our undying gratitude, our thanks for being a part of this family. This is the good stuff. This is the fun stuff. It's not for everybody we get this, but for the folks who get it, the folks who understand what it is we're trying to do by telling these stories, You'll understand why this is so great and why this is just some awesome content that nobody else is putting out out there. So what do you say? Let's strap in. Let's get ready. Let's get geared up because episode 10 is coming to you. The Real DEA Narcos on The Real DEA Narcos. We are back. Episode 10, Diaz. Or as they say in Farsi, da. So, uh, you know, pick your favorite language, 10. 10 is the magic number because now we're wrapping this thing up. But we're wrapping this thing up and there's a couple of big events that happen late November before we get into actually finding Pablo for the final time. And that's Escobar's family. And this is one of the things Pablo's been working on is to try to get them out of the country. As long as they're in the country, they can be leveraged. They can be targets. He wants to get them out of the country. And so there's two times they try and get out of the country. The first time this was happened out of Medellin. And so I, I want to talk to you about this though, too, um, Javier, because you were the one involved in this first operation. Escobar, his wife, kids, they're in Medellin. They ended up, how the hell did they end up with visas to the United States in order to get out of the country? How did that happen? <laughs> That's a great question. And, and, and to answer that, after, I'm, you know, I'm going a little bit uh, ahead of time. When we did the investigation, how did they end up getting visas? Because I, I have to say that getting visas to come to the United States, that's a hard process. It's a lot of people get denied. And, and Escobar's family would have been rejected in getting visas because, you know, uh, the monies are from uh, trafficking. So they, uh, they would not have gotten a visa. Anyway, so what we found out after the investigation is that the passports in Medellin were sent to a uh, travel agency. And back then, the travel agencies would get as many passports together. They'd write a letter basically saying we're vouching uh, for this people and they'd send it into the embassy. And one of the faults that the embassy discovered is that a lot of this uh, passports that were sent to them from uh, official, you know, good standing, rep reputable standing travel agencies were granted. So that, that was one of the, you know, the embassy says, man, hey, we've been screwing up here. And that after that, that changed. And now it's uh, they don't honor that uh, anymore. So so basically it wasn't that they were able to bribe their way at it. So they just took, took advantage of a glitch in the system for approvals and uh, getting the visas. Yeah, that is correct. Well, but the story doesn't stop there because they do try to get out of Medellin and you are being given an order. Let's walk through that now. The family's there. They're, they're going to try and fly out to Miami. And what is your job at that point? What's the orders you're given? And I'm at the Carlos Olguin base at our, you know, where we uh, lived. And uh, we get a call and uh, it, it was from a source coming into the 800 number we had at the police base that the 
Escobar family was at the airport in Medellin trying to leave Medellin. So I remember uh, there was Colonel Castro who was there. He was the second guy in charge of the of the search block. So he said, let's go check it out, Javier. And it was kind of a, you know, we didn't have much going on right now. So I remember getting the chopper. We landed at the, we landed at the Rio Negro airport. So uh, we go in to the airport. And by this time, there's uh, police. And it was uh, an Avianca flight. It, they were still not inside the airplane, but they were... Uh, the police were waiting for Colonel Castro and myself to show up. They had stopped the boarding process. And uh, so when we get there, um, I see it's, it's uh, Pablo Escobar's wife, his son, and his little daughter. And so we start, you know, uh, we start checking the passports. And I'm, and remember, I'm not supposed to be involved because, you know, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be there, right? <laughs> so, uh, of course, you right. missed a rule of follow course. you. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're bringing me the passports, and I'm like, man, what do I do? You know. So I said, well, let me call the embassy. Uh, and I remember I could not get a hold of Mr. Toss, so I said, somebody just direct me to the ambassador's office. And I, and you know what? They put the ambassador on the phone, which was lucky for me. And that, nowadays, that would never happen. Uh, just an agent calling up an ambassador, that would, that, and I think we said it before, like Steve said, this, this ambassador was a, was a hands-on type of ambassador. So anyway, so I'm luck, I'm lucky, and this is all happening because the cops are detained, not letting them get on the airplane, and they're all looking at me. Javier, what do we do? <laughs> we need a decision. Do we let them go or not? So anyway, I said, no, Mr. Ambassador, this is what we have. We have his wife, his son, and his little girl. I, I mean, as far as I can tell, the visas look legit. I have them, and I think this is the first time in history. Uh, State Department, you know, because I have no authorization. When they tell a, a, an agent, a DEA agent says, all right, get the passports where the visa is. And it, it was a whole page with a visa. He says, tear it out. I said, what? <laughs> he said, tear out the visa page from, the, from their passports and you keep it. And I said, and I remember the ambassador being real strict. He says, do what I'm what I'm telling you to do. Okay, yes, sir. So I tore, tore up their visa. And I think he told me, he says, if they want to apply for a visa, tell them we'll make an appointment for them, come into the, you know, into the embassy in Bogota, and we will talk to them. <laughs> and that later, yeah, oh, yeah. I and bet. that was publicized <laughs> later on in the paper. So anyway, all this commotion, and I always, I will never forget that scene, because uh, you know people were starting to yell, the Escobar people yelling at the cops, we we have a right to get on the plane, and they were not letting them, so a lot of yelling, screaming, uh, people started crying. It, it it was chaotic scene, but I'll always remember the scene of his little girl, his daughter, which she was just a little girl. I'm not going to mention her name, but anyway. That's that's his daughter, and uh, she just sits on the floor, and she starts petting. She had a little white poodle uh, with her. So she sits on the floor and just starts talking to her little dog, petting him, and just oblivious to the chaos <clears throat> going, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to the chaos on the outside, the people yelling, the people screaming. She's just there sitting and, and talking to her little dog. And I've always imagined what was she going through? What I mean, she's seen the worst of the worst. And and right now, you know, everybody's yelling and screaming, and she's just, you know, she just sits down and starts talking to her little dog, uh, just trying to shut shut off the rest of the world. But wow, that's got to be a that all that scene always stuck in my mind. So afterwards, basically, I had the visas, and uh, they were not allowed to travel. And, uh, well, basically, when you rip something out of a passport, it kind of uh, makes the passport invalid, too. You're not supposed to no, rip you're pages. Not. I mean, I, later on, <laughs> I've, I've heard 
that that, that was once in a lifetime. <laughs> Way to go, I know, Javier. That's like un, a passport is untouchable, right? Basically, you can't mess with it. It's your personal. The government, uh, your country has given it to you. It's your personal right. Uh, you know, but, you know, this was under the ambassador says, I am ordering you. Yes, sir. I will uh, obey your orders. <laughs> that was kind of funny. But uh, and. Uh, well, but Pablo, Pablo got so pissed, he actually appealed to the U.S. government. Is this the time where he appealed and he was kind of taking his case to the uh, public? Did, did he, was this the time where he had this, quote, fax interview with the New York Times? Uh, I think, yeah, he, he did something. He, I remember, and that's why the ambassador was, you know, publicized saying, hey, have him come in. We'll talk to him. Have Mr. Escobar come into the embassy, and we'll talk to him and explain the the process. Uh, so, and there was some yes, there there, there was some uh, obstacles in that Pablo Escobar tried to take it to the world press, saying, "Hey, that's is illegal. What the U.S. has done to us." But oh, isn't that's rich? I mean, the irony here too, because he he tried this tactic again, where he says. Hey, if you just let my family go, I'll turn myself in. And it's kind of like, yeah, pal, I think, you know, the the train has left right, the station right. on that one. Yeah, there's yeah, no going back here. But I also w- like to think about why Miami? So basically Miami, he still had contacts there. He still had a lot of connections. You know, here I'm the world's uh, most sought after trafficker. And I'm sending my family to Miami, Florida. So you got to think about that underlying why was he going to Miami. And uh, we, I think we've already mentioned it, right, Steve? That house uh, he had bought in Miami 30 years ago, something where he actually signed his name on the deed. House is worth, I don't know, $15, $20 million for it. So, you know, it just goes to prove he still had a big stronghold in the United States. Well, so, I mean, that kind of, so, I mean, there's a lot of hoopla around that, but that's not the last time they try and get out of the country. In fact, this next time when they try and get out of the country, Steve, you get to play a uh, tourist because, uh, and the press, because I think you mentioned this before you're six two, you, you're, you're a gringo yes, to the I max. Am. I mean, you've got, you know, you stand out except when you're a member of what might be considered to be the press, you know, you're out there with cameras. So let's talk about now the second time when they try and get out of the country, it's not through Medellin, it's through Bogota. How did you get onto that? And what led you guys to being down at the airport this second time to try and stop the Escobars yet a, a second time trying to get out of the country? Well, this particular time, Javier and I have, happened to both be in Bogota at the embassy when Javier got a call from a source saying, hey, the family, uh, you know, Pablo's family is trying to leave the country again. They're at El Dorado Airport, which is the main airport in Bogota, trying to catch a flight. So we grabbed the cameras and, and uh, you know, we had one of our Escoltas drive us out to the airport, told Mr. Toff what we were doing. And uh, and this time, you know, I'm carrying a, a, a 35 millimeter camera with a telephoto lens because, you know, we're pretty sure Pablo's not going to be there, you know, because he's wanted and everybody knows his photograph. But shame on us if we're not there and something does happen. And so we also wanted to determine, is this really the family? Who's traveling with them? You know, who's providing protection for them? The whole ball of wax. So for me to stand there, you know, being the the lily white person that I am physically with a telephoto lens on a camera, I didn't stick out at all because the world press was out there taking pictures of Pablo's family as well. Uh, What we saw was in these pictures uh, are on the Internet, I believe, where you can see men in plain clothes, carrying weapons, holding machine guns up. That was uh, the attorney general's uh, protection detail. They were providing protection for the Escobar family. So DeGriff and his gang were providing protection for the Escobars at the airport? So they, you know, we recognize the people. I mean, we knew, we used to go to meetings in DeGriff's office all the time, and you saw, you know, the armed guards that were there, and, and you got to recognize, and they knew who we were. And you recognize these guys on the bus. They're hanging out the door trying to keep people away from the Escobar family. And it's, the bus it was uh, an Avianca bus that was taking them, you know, was trying to get to the main terminal so they could get to the international terminal to fly to Germany. Does this not smell? I mean, at this point, now you've got the AG's office who's been obviously doing all of their own negotiations. But did, did, was this just like a little too much now that they had armed AG personnel escorting the family at the airport? I mean, is that kind of like 
you know, is that, did that really kind of, was that the straw, the final straw, or was there even worse stuff with the Oh, AG's there was office? worse stuff. We, we went to meetings. Uh, I remember, I remember when Barry Abbott came down from headquarters and we went to a meeting with Mickey Ramirez, who was one of Pablo's, uh, was a member of the Medellin cartel, who I believe handled aviation transportation routes. And we were talking to Mickey about, uh, you know, we wanted to talk to him about potentially getting information about where Escobar was hiding and help us locate him. Well, Mickey showed up with his own, all his Sicarios. I mean, we were, <laughs> we were severely outgunned that day. It was me, Javier, and, and a headquarters agent, Barry Abbott, with one Escolta. You know, we all had our sidearms, and these guys were showing up with shotguns and long guns and machine guns and, you know, every other kind of gun you can come up with. But one of those people we recognized as one of DeGrief's bodyguards that was providing protection detail for Mickey Ramirez, who was a wanted criminal. He's a drug trafficker. And if I can add on that premise, that's what DeGrief was doing. The attorney general was blessing other traffickers who had worked uh, for Escobar. So now he was saying, traffickers, I will take care. Don't worry about your past crimes. As long as you're helping us locate Pablo Escobar, you are now informants. And like Steve said, Mika Ramirez was one of the biggest traffickers uh, in, in Colombia responsible for tonnage of cocaine that was being sent. So he, like who else? Like Don Berna, Remember, the head of Los Pepes were now blessed by the Colombia Attorney General to work with the search block in locating Pablo Escobar. Well, did anybody did anybody uh, nab Mickey? Did they take him into custody, or was he nah, off limits? He, he was off limits, and because uh, he was protected by the Attorney General, who's going to fall charges? I mean, it was just a disgrace. But it, you know, and this is how, uh, you know, when we talk about Don Berna, that's what happened. Don Berna was blessed by uh, the Attorney General to work, you know, with the Colombians. It's like Javier said in the last episode. In Colombia, you learn to expect the unexpected. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, that's why people always say, hey, how's it going? I say, I don't know. Day's not <laughs> over right. yet. It could change, you know, in, at any that's time, exactly right? right? Well, so so now they're at the airport, so you've got all of this hoopla. Um, so what happens now, Steve? I mean, you, these guys come in, they, they've got the armed guards. What's the family do? Where are they going? Do they actually make it onto the plane? Well, they get into the airport, and they, they get over to where the international uh, flights are going out, and they're going through the process. In the meantime, we're trying to uh, call the embassy and report everything that we're you know, watching take place. And we're just kind of blending in. We're now inside the airport, so we can kind of blend in as an international passenger. So we really didn't stick out like a sore thumb. Quick question. Do they need visas? At that, do you remember if they needed visas to go to Germany or could they just fly to Germany? I don't remember. Do you? I don't know. I don't remember either. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, and some of our police counterparts are starting to arrive out there, some of the Dahin guys. And uh, so once they get their tickets and everything, they, you know, it, it's a big commotion in the airport because it now words out who they are. And so they put them in a private room. I, Lufthansa Airlines had a private room. I don't know if it was the first class lounge or what, but, uh, you know, they were able to get them out of the public's eye. So uh, we're we're calling the uh, the embassy. You know, we're what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Mr. Toff's wanting us to stop the flight. There's no way we can stop it. We can't stop them from getting on the flight. The Colombian our Colombian uh, partners are saying the same thing. The police. So what this leads to is we decide that uh, we're going to put one of our agents and a couple of Colombian police officers on there in an undercover capacity. Now, you know, the Escobar family travels first class because they've got so much money. And it was the, uh, I can't remember what type of plane it is, but it's the one that has the double decker where the first class is upstairs. And then the. That's probably the 747, so. you mean? Back then it would have been, yeah, the 747. And this is Lufthansa Airlines. And, and so we had to buy first class tickets at the last minute for our, you know, our, our agent and the two undercover police officers. Oh, money's not a problem for DEA. Don't worry. Just put it on my credit card. Yeah, there's a little bit more involved than that, but we got them on there. And, uh, uh, our agent had a, uh, we had, we had a, a bag that was rigged up with a camera inside that had a little pinhole lens so that all you had to do is it didn't look like a camera thing. It looked like just a, like a, uh, maybe a camera bag itself, but he was allowed, he, you know, he could 
pull the he could touch the hidden switch in the handle and take pictures with that bag. And, you know, what we're trying to determine is, are they meeting other people on the plane who's traveling with them? I think it turned out to be the wife, the son, his girlfriend, and the daughter. Was there anybody else, JP? Right. I think there was another lady, and there was, because she was also traveling with them when they were going to Miami. They always had another lady involved. We knew her. I forget her name at this time. But you, but the agent and the other people you had aboard, they were they able to maintain their covert status on the plane? Did, did they ever get made? Well, they say they weren't. Um, if you read uh, the book that Pablo's wife wrote, uh, which I read here not long ago, uh, she said they noticed that there were uh, a couple of people in first class that seemed extremely suspicious. Uh, you know, I. I yeah, were their last names Escobar? Is that what she no, meant? No, they, she's talking about uh, she's talking about our guys. Yeah, I don't. I honestly, I don't believe it. I don't think that she picked up yeah. on anything. But that's what yeah. her story is. And, and if I can add, Steve, remember one of the Colombians was the, he's pretty famous in Colombia. Uh, got to be General uh, Leonardo Gallegos, who mm-hmm. was there, and he's important because he's the one who led the operation that resulted in uh, Jose Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha, Escobar's partner, getting killed. So he was one of the undercover cops. At that time, he was a colonel, uh, kind of well-known in Colombia, but the the, the Colombian sent him on, on board. So as the the military terminology is we now have a major Charlie mm-hmm. Foxtrot, which is a clusterfuck for you uninitiated. So... You guys now have a major Charlie Foxtrot on your hands. Now, the to, not to keep people in suspense, but what happens? So, Steve, what happens at this point? Do they they're, make it on the plane? Plane takes off? What goes? What happens yep, next? They made it on the plane. Our guys are on the plane. The plane takes off, and Javier and I are in the car with our, our driver and, and trying to get back to the embassy as quickly as possible. And if you've never been to Bogota, the traffic there is just horrendous. Uh, you don't go anywhere in a hurry. But as soon as we got back to the embassy, now it's a it's an all night, an all day, all night ordeal, trying to negotiate. And of course, this has gone way above our levels. You know, our boss, Mr. Toff, is aware. He's brought it to the attention of the ambassador. The ambassador is calling the White House. They call the State Department. Uh, we've got the highest levels in Washington now calling the Chancellor of Germany. You know, I mean, that's it was that level. So so is the president of the U.S. getting involved at this point? I don't point? know if he was personally involved, but he's personally aware of what's going on and directing, you know, that he wants this stopped, that we want the Germans to not allow them to enter Germany. Uh, we don't know why they were going to Germany. Uh, we don't know, was that their final destination or was that just a, a stopping point to, to move on to the next location? Did they have property in Germany as like they did in Miami? Later on, we found out, remember, and it was, uh, I think I was talking to the retired uh, country out of Schaefer, DEA, and uh, he was telling me that they did own some property uh, in that area. I think it was yeah, around Frankfurt yeah, they, or they, something. They, they did own property there. So when the flight lands, as the story has been relayed to us, and this is by, you know, we had DEA agents in Frankfurt at the airport with the German authorities when that flight landed. And as I understand, when the flight landed, it was not allowed to go to the terminal. It was taken to a, a, a taxiway somewhere and made to wait. So <laughs> all these people are waiting simply because the Escobar family's on there, and that's the German government trying to determine what they're going to do. So when they finally let, I think they had a bus come out and take the family off of the plane is the way I remember it. And they put the Escobar family into quarantine uh, inside the the Frankfurt Airport. I don't know if you've ever been to Frankfurt. It's a huge, huge airport over there. Yeah. So uh, we've got our agents, our local agents on the ground there that live in, in Frankfurt are, are working hand in hand with the German authorities. And they've since told us that it was, uh, when the family got there, it was 50-50. There was some Germans wanted to be allowed to enter and some wanted to be expelled. So that negotiation went on all night long. Uh, the next morning, the German authorities made the decision to expel the family back to Bogota. So on the next flight out of Frankfurt back to Bogota, the family was placed on that flight and sent back home. Our guys are on that flight as well, our, our agent and the two Columbia police officers. Did you guys provide a reception for them when they landed at Bogota? Well, Javi and I were there at the airport yeah, waiting yeah, for them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, it's us. Did you have a welcome back yeah. home sign? They didn't even come up and say hello or anything to us. You know, just ignored us. Oh, gosh. <laughs> 
Oh, dang. Who, who would have thought? Well, well, I mean, so, so, I mean, this, but this is a major issue, right? I mean, it's hitting the press, it's hitting the headlines. If people didn't know about Pablo and it, you didn't know what was going on in Colombia, you sure as hell did now, well, right? And you're going to love this part. If you like what you've heard so far, this is only part 10 of a 12 part exclusive episode with Steve and JP, the two guys who helped bring down and end the reign of Pablo Escobar, the world's most wanted narco terrorist, and the inspiration for the hit Netflix series Narcos and the spinoff Narcos Mexico, which just finished up season three. If you want to hear the real story, if you want to hear how this ends, if you want to hear from the people who were actually there, not a bunch of other people telling the story about Pablo, but the people who were feet on the ground working with the Colombian police who were there when history was being made, then you got to head on over to patreon.com slash game of crimes, patreon.com slash game of crimes. That's where we host all of these episodes. And no matter what level you come in at, everybody gets access to these episodes. If you like this, we've also got a bunch of other content. We've got our Narcometer review each month of some of the top movies, things that you vote on. You are players and tell us what you want to hear about. We also have our random surprises. You never know what Murph and I are going to talk about. We have got a ton of great content, especially stuff like this. Again, this is the real deal. You will not hear this anywhere else. So we've got over 45 pieces of great content. We've got videos, depending on what level you're at. We've got exclusive interviews with people that you will not get anywhere. Plus, we have a couple surprises. One of those, depending on when you're listening to this, if it's early enough, December 22nd, 2021 at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on our Facebook page, we're going to be giving away a Patreon special as we review the greatest Christmas movie ever made, Die Hard. Yes, folks, that's right. Die Hard is the greatest Christmas movie ever made. Conversation's over. Into discussion. We'll be talking about it. Murph and I will talking about the tactics, the operations, the weapons, everything that goes on as John McClane puts an end to Hans Gruber. And guess what, guys? It's not Christmas until Hans Gruber falls off a of Nakatomi Plaza. Spoiler alert. Yes, Hans Gruber dies. But then again, you would know that if you've always watched the greatest Christmas movie ever made. So join us at facebook.com slash Game of Crimes podcast. We're going to be doing it for free. And then the replay of it will be available on our page anytime you want to come back and view and see what it is you're missing. So thanks, guys. This was a special preview of episode 10 of a 12-part exclusive series called The Real DEA Narcos talking about the real DEA Narcos and how they brought down the world's most wanted narco terrorist, Pablo Escobar. <laughs>